morning, everyone. Um, I thought uh, just to give you a overview of this energy option. I know a few people couldn't actually attend uh, our classes as we did them together. So I thought I would just quickly flip through the PowerPoint slides. Uh, some of this will be reviewed for some people, but hopefully we can hit some of the major points. It might bring up some questions. Uh, make sure you jot them down, and when we have our office hours, you can definitely ask me that. So uh, just a quick overview of these PowerPoint slides. Uh, again, credit to Mr. Eastwood and Richmond in uh, creating these slides for us. So, uh, C1 has to do with energy sources. So basically uh, questioning where do we actually get our energy from. So just click here. Uh, first thing we do is we define a useful energy source. What makes a source useful is that it definitely provides us the energy in the form that we want. But as we convert energy from one form to the other, it has to be at a reasonable rate. So we did an example of uh, rainwater that's stored in clouds have a lot of gravitational potential energy. Unfortunately, unless it's pouring torrential rain or whatnot, that energy is being given off all too slowly. Uh, the opposite extreme would be, let's say, nuclear reactions. For nuclear reactions, unfortunately, to safely deal with uh, fission reactions and maybe potentially uh, fusion reactions in the future, um, the energy gets released all too quickly. Uh, the risk of having a meltdown is uh, not going to be, uh, it's going to be very high, so that's too quick. So what we need is some compromise, something that's more reasonable. We also do want to be thinking about our environment as well, so we don't want to be producing any unnecessary pollution, uh, greenhouse gases that are causing uh, consequences like global warming and other uh, effects. So, uh, useful energy sources have to be reasonable rate as well as minimal pollution. Uh, that for now. Uh, we talked about a big idea, energy is conserved, E in is equal to E out. Uh, of course this is true only for the universe, so as a system, let's pretend we have an exothermic reaction, my chemicals may actually lose energy during reactions, it's not that the energy has vanished, but the energy has just been transferred and given out to the surroundings instead. So whatever is lost in the system is picked up by the surroundings and vice versa. However, even though we had that first law, energy is always E and is E out overall, what we say here is the quality of energy is being degraded. The usefulness of the energy, if I can actually access it, is actually being degraded because some of this uh, heat here is uh, dispersed to the surroundings, uh, it's lost due to the entropy of the system, whatever, so the quantity of the energy that you can utilize is now going to be less. So the quality of energy does matter. Uh, how come our whole society is built so much so on these non-renewable sources? The primary reason are these non-renewable sources, whether they're nuclear fuels or fossil fuels, is because they produce, provide very quality energy and it's relatively safe to work with. So uh, there's our fossil fuels, non-renewable uh, energy sources. Renewable, what we're trying to look into more so is utilizing solar energy more, uh, utilizing um, like recycling and uh, using plants, uh, using uh, other means that doesn't rely on coal that takes millions of years to generate. So, uh, renewable energy sources should be naturally replenished uh, in a not a crazy time scale like forming coal. Uh, it has to be useful to humans. Whereas non-renewable energy sources, all the fossil fuel sources like crude oil and gasolines, petroleum products have been finite and will eventually run out. So this one here is C2, fossil fuels. Fossil fuels were formed by a reduction of biological compounds. So uh, how coal was formed, we look at sort of um, plant matter and animal matter here, dinosaurs, they died off in these swamps here, they got buried over millions of years and they end up turning into coal. But this process takes forever. Petroleum in a similar manner, uh, I mentioned when we we're going through this here, petroleum is more so formed through sort of oceanic creatures, aquatic creatures. They also die, they get buried, and they end up forming these deposits. When we actually um, dig these deposits out of the ground, unfortunately it's a huge mixture of a bunch of these hydrocarbons here. Uh, the plant matter itself would have had carbons, hydrogens, and oxygens. As this process of high pressure and high temperature reduction occurs, we tend to lose oxygen faster. Uh, than the carbon and the hydrogen, so therefore we end up forming products that are mainly C's and H's. Because the C's and H's are in this big mix, and uh, depending on the length of the chain, we can actually separate them by a method called fractional distillation. So what this involves here is starting off with the crude oil that we dig up uh, from the ground or from deep uh, beneath the ocean. We heat up all of it to about 400 to 500 degrees. Some of these molecules here are horrendously long based on how long my chain is, that's gonna have an impact on how strong the London forces are. 
So if I have a really, really long chain, I may also be non-polar like these lighter chains, but being such a heavy molar mass with the strong London forces, that's actually going to have very high boiling points. So when I have become a gas here, maybe by the time I hit 450 degrees, maybe even 400 degrees, I've already uh, condensed back into a liquid. I basically can taper off the liquid based on what the heaviness of the compound is. The lighter masses, which have small intermolecular forces, will stay gases for longer. As they go farther and farther away from the heat source, they're gonna remain as gas, eventually condensing at these uh, top parts. So they say here, the larger molecules are not super useful. They typically need to be refined. Unfortunately, if I just did this fractional distillation, we don't get a ton of the C5 to C10, which is what we're typically interested in, uh, fuels for cars, things like that. We do some chemistry to actually um, produce more of uh, those amounts. So that's fractional distillation. We talked about it being heated at the bottom. The longest chain have uh, uh, highest boiling points, so they're the first ones to condense, and then now we've separated them into fractions. Um, especially when we look at mixtures of gasolines, we can talk about the grade of the fuel uh, measured by octane number. Uh, octane number, this is just um, uh, leftover from history, uh, they found that a isomer of octane, uh, you can call it isooctane, it's actually 224 trimethylpentane, so it's actually just a five carbon chain. Um, that isooctane molecule actually burned really well. That was defined to be an octane number of zero, uh, sorry, octane number of 100, whereas hexane was found to be an octane number of zero. It tended to cause uh, engines to make a knocking sound. It tended to cause the ignitions to be not at the right positions as when the pistons, pistons were fully uh, ignited and fully expanded. So we're actually losing energy, eventually maybe damaging engines. So uh, heptane was sort of used as the standard of having zero octane, whereas isooctane is 100 octane. Nowadays, we have chemicals that have like 106 octane, 107 octane, like methanol and ethanol are examples of those two, uh, but definitely not a percentage. Uh, octane rating is just a nice uh, grade of if we had a mixture of a heptane with zero and isooctane with 100, how nicely does this fuel burn? So, uh, those are the uh, fuels at this point here. We have different octane ratings from 87 to 94. Uh, not every car needs the highest quality grade, so it really depends on how your manufacturer has uh, engineered the engine. Uh, so this octane number, we want to be burning with a good amount of oxygen that follows the right stoichiometry. If the oxygen ratios are, in this case here, let's first have too little. So I have a rich fuel-air mixture, I have too much fuel versus how much air that I have, I don't have enough oxygen, that gave us something called partial combustion. Uh, incomplete combustion, so that tended to produce very dirty flames of carbon soot and carbon monoxides. Too much oxygen could be a bad thing as well. We have a lean fuel-air mixture. I don't have a lot of fuel as compared to the air. It leads to this uh, concept of knocking. So, uh, Straight chains are uh, relatively prone to knocking, whereas if we can isomerize them, we can increase branching, if we can make rings and we can make aromatics, they tend to burn a little bit better than before. So there's octane uh, rating. We see heptane with a zero, isooctane here with 100. Uh, cracking and reforming are two chemical ways of actually producing more of the C5 to C10 uh, size molecules for our purposes here. Uh, cracking in general means taking a big molecule and breaking it up. This could be done via just high temperature. So this is thermal cracking. Uh, we can do catalytic cracking as well where catalysts actually get involved. Uh, there's some little more chemistry in here. If I take a long alkane, whenever I crack it, it only produces one alkane, whereas the remaining parts are actually alkenes. So one alkane, hopefully shorter, hopefully in that C5 to C10 region. So thermal cracking, we can use water under high pressures or catalytic cracking. Make sure you know this word here, zeolite. A zeolite is a fancy word for a naturally occurring aluminum minerals and silicon minerals. They typically provide a surface for the cracking reaction to occur. We can actually control which parts of the long chain actually break off and create what sort of alkanes that we're interested in. So, uh, reforming, we take a bunch of these straight chain. These ones here are subject to a lot of knocking. If I can somehow isomerize them, uh, either via catalyst or whatnot, I get a big mixture. Uh, because these ones here are structural isomers, they're going to have slightly different physical properties. I can separate off those branched isomers and then recycle the straight chain back through the cycle again. 
Uh, other types of um, reforming that can improve the octane rating here is cyclization. So basically taking a straight chain and converting it into a cyclic molecule or aromatization, which is making an aromatic molecule, both of which will improve the octane rating. Um, so coal has a major disadvantage. Uh, you can typically only harness it in very big power plants. So typically we run chemical reactions, we convert coal, uh, we either gasify or liquefy it, we convert it into other chemicals which tend to be easier to work with as fuels, uh, gaseous or liquid hydrocarbons. So for gasification here, we take our pure carbon, which is our coal product, uh, we react it with water, we produce H2 and CO as prime products, these guys here can actually be used as a fuel themselves, or I run them through a further reaction and I end up making those alkanes to actually burn them as shown in this liquefaction uh, reaction. So I'm just making alkanes here. We do worry about a carbon footprint. So uh, carbon footprint is a measure of uh, in a year, uh, how much equivalent carbon dioxide do we produce in tons? Uh, definitely the extra carbon dioxide in the air is uh, believed to be causing global warming and we can actually uh, measure the carbo, uh, carbon footprint uh, for an environmental measure. So uh, carbon footprint here, they describe it with a global warming potential. In your notes, it's also called a greenhouse factor. They make CO2 a standard potential of one. So basically, uh, if something has a global warming potential, let's say water only has 0.1, I need 10 water molecules to have the same equivalent effect as CO2, whereas something like methane, it's a lot lower abundance, but the molecule itself tends to behave like 30 carbon dioxide. Its potential to affect the greenhouse uh, uh, phenomenon is gonna be 30 times stronger. In fact, the strongest or the most abundant greenhouse gas is actually water, although because that occurs naturally, typically we ignore water's impact and we go straight to the CO2 and we go straight to the other chemicals listed here as some sort of agricultural byproducts that are causing the extra CO2. So uh, let's skip over here to our nuclear case here with nuclear fission and fusion. Uh, for fission reactions, fission means break up. So what we're going to do is we're going to take heavy nuclei and we're going to break them up into smaller nuclei. Uh, the reason why it uh, naturally, spontaneously will break up is because it increases what's called the binding energy per nucleon. The binding energy is a concept that describes uh, how much energy uh, is released when a nuclei forms together. So the big idea here is if you actually add up the individual masses of individual protons and neutrons, even electrons there, and you compare it to the actual mass that your combined atom actually is, the sum of the individual particles is actually a little bit heavier. When it actually forms together, there is a little bit of stability because of the strong nuclear force. With that extra stability, the extra energy called binding energy is released off, and that's the energy that we're trying to harness uh, in nuclear power plants as an energy source. So, uh, strong nuclear force holds our nuclei together. Binding energy, depending on how you look at it, either the individual particles are glued together, binding energy is released, or if you manage to fission, if you manage to separate a nuclei, it's this very same energy that gets released as well. So, greater the binding energy, the more stable the nucleus is. So this graph here plots the average binding energy divided by how many nucleons. Nucleons are protons plus neutrons. As we go higher and higher on this, the more stable we get. So whether we're a very heavy element like uranium isotopes here, as it breaks up and fizzes, we tend to get a stronger, more stable uh, isotope or we have things that are light, we can fuse them together, fusing small nuclei, combining them together. Based on this diagram, iron-56, that particular isotope, has the most stable nuclei based on the number of nucleons that we have. So everyone will naturally want to go to iron-56, but not necessarily very quickly. Uh, binding energy is also uh, from this mass defect. So the mass defect, as I mentioned, is the uh, how much mass was lost if I add up all the individual particles themselves and I compare that to the mass once the atom itself forms. So the nuclei are lighter, uh, the equivalent uh, mass that's lost is converted to energy that gets released. So where did the mass go? We can use Einstein's equation, E is mc squared, use the 3 times 10 to the 8 to calculate how many joules of energy were actually produced. So there's some practice there. So a fission reaction, we've done this with nuclear power plants. So we take uranium-235, which is the nuclear radioactive form of uranium. 
we fire slow moving neutrons. We need uh, things called moderators to slow down the neutrons. The neutron gets absorbed into uranium 235. It causes the breakup. And basically, through that breakup, we produce a bunch of these daughter isotopes here. Some of those are which themselves reactive. They end up generating extra neutrons, and these other neutrons end up going off to trigger other reactions. So not only do we need moderators to control how fast the neutrons come in, we also need control rods to actually control how many neutrons on average are given off before these neutrons hit other uranium-235s. The worry is if there's too few, the chain reaction won't be sustained. If the neutrons sort of cycle and spiral out of control, one neutron in and more neutrons out, uh, this reaction can lead to nuclear meltdown. Uh, critical mass, so this is the perfect number that we need for these neutrons here have a good chance of running into other uh, fissile or fissionable materials uh, before uh, leaving. So again, 235 is the radioactive form. Unfortunately for us in our universe, uranium-238 is the more common isotope, about 98-99% of it is actually this heavier isotope. We need a way to enrich the uranium-238 into the 235 form. Uh, there is another sort of model of this. Instead of using uranium by itself, we've produced what are called breeder reactions. These reactions use plutonium instead as a radioactive isotope. It also comes chemically from a uranium-238 reaction, but you can harness plutonium as well, and you can actually design uh, nuclear reactions out of plutonium. So back to doing the enriching here. Uranium, it could be the 238 or the 235 isotope. We use this nice molecule UF6. This one here, it's a very big molecule. It has a lot of electrons. You would imagine that would make it in the uh, solid state. But in fact, this one here is a gas at room temperatures. And because it's a gas, it's fairly easy to work with. We can enrich it. Okay. They're going to compare it to UO2 as a uh, random ionic compound here. Because this one here is an ionic compound, this one is solid, and it stays solid upwards of 2,800 degrees. Whereas when you compare it to UF6, which is covalent, Despite all the number of electrons, because of the individual polarities between U and F, we end up getting it's nonpolar, but it tends to still have a low sublimation point. So it converts to gas at a relatively low temperature. You don't need the 2,000 degrees or so to actually hit those temperatures. So uranium-235 is the physal, is the fissionable form. We need to enrich the 238 into the 235. So how we're going to do it here, first way is uh, to do with diffusion or effusion. So basically, I'm going to take my gas here. We have Graham's law, which we derive from kinetic energy conservation here. Basically, because the uranium-238 is slightly heavier, uh, one of the masses is going to uh, diffuse through uh, pores a little bit faster than the other one. And in this case here, if we manage to harness this here, I pump in a source of UF6, which is the mixture of uranium-235 and 238. We're going to have the 235 travel ever so slightly faster because it has a smaller mass. We're going to have a slightly enriched form of 235. I pump the rest through. I cycle it through many, many times of this. And overall, in time, I can have a higher sample of uranium-235. They usually say I have to run this through some 1,000, 2,000 times before I've enriched it even by maybe 3 4% or so. Uh, the other way we can do it is using a centrifuge, so spiraling it through this chamber here as it circles through. Because the uranium-235 is a little bit heavier, it gets spun out towards the outside, whereas I can take the smaller radius motion for the uranium-235 and collect the slightly um, uh, lighter isotope. What are some risk issues associated with this? Okay, it could be health effects. Uh, how do we deal with the waste? We talked about pretty much most of our waste disposal is let's just dig a deep hole in the ground. Um, let's put it in a geologically stable area. Hopefully no earthquakes, things like that. And hopefully let's let it wait out the half-life. Uh, there's a risk of meltdown if you're not controlling it properly, and also the worry is uh, in weaponizing. For uranium, we're not too, too worried because the enriching process takes uh, a lot um, before you can harness an OP-235, but definitely for those plutonium, those breeder reactions, it's a lot easier to weaponize. So, uh, Some health effects here, all the alpha, beta, and gamma radiation, it can react with the water that makes up your matter and actually can ionize, can cause dislodging of electrons. It can go and react with other particles as well. Here are some uh, other radicals, hydroxy radicals. All of them can be damaging to our living cells. Uh, in that case there, it was fission so far. For lighter nuclei, they also will increase binding energy by joining together. 
we really haven't been able to harness this on the Earth because we need really, really hot temperatures. So we use the model of inside stars and uh, solar systems uh, where it's already really hot. It's by fusing light elements that actually provides the solar energy that we get. So for fusion reactions, it's promising, but it's uh, hard hard to do because you need to maintain really hot temperatures, really expensive equipment trying to do uh, strong magnetic confinement, electric confinement, and but the advantage is uh, it produces uh, very little waste. So this is the holy grail, it's not yet viable. We're going to go to our uh, star analogy here. How do we know that stars are made out of hydrogen uh, helium? We look at their emission spectra, Remember, the spectra that we see from the sun is only the composition of the top layer of the sun. Uh, it's possible that because of the corona, the first sort of atmosphere layer on the sun, not quite an atmosphere, but that layer there can actually absorb some of the radiation and actually block out some of the other incident radiation. But what we end up seeing is the surface temperature. By looking at the spectrum, by looking at where the bands show up, we can not only figure out what chemicals there are, we're also figuring out what uh, abundances that they are. So hydrogen and helium have different signatures. Back to our radioactive uh, isotopes with different half-lives. Some are really long, some are really short. So we take half-life to worry about the time it needs for half of it to decay. Uh, these are types of radiation, alpha, beta, gamma. Alpha is the least penetrating, so it's easily stopped by even a piece of paper. Those are the ones that we use for Thompson's Gold Flow experiment. Beta particles are about 100 times stronger. Gamma particles are about 100 times stronger even than that. Uh, in terms of disposal of waste here, uh, it really depends on what type of waste we have. So we define it uh, between low level and high level waste. Low level waste is, let's say you were wearing gloves when you were wor working with radioactive materials, um, the gloves will have inevitably absorbed some of those nuclear isotopes, daughter isotopes, things like that, but that's relatively low uh, risk, low level. Um, that's gonna actually be the more abundant. So we're gonna have a lot of this material that's low level. Uh, actually, most of the radiation, we don't have a lot of it, is considered high level waste. And this one here really are the active daughter isotopes after running it through a power plant, after uh, depleting a control rod, it's still very, very radioactive. Uh, it's a very small fraction of what's on the earth, but it actually contains most of the radioactivity. So. Uh, pretty much what we try to do, like I mentioned, is just uh, dig a deep hole and then uh, dig it uh, underneath. So C4 and C8, we talked about uh, transferring energy in a nuclear uh, example. Nuclear, every time we transfer energy from one form to the other, we inevitably lose a little bit of that energy. The advantage of doing solar is it only needs one conversion, light directly into electrical. So we talked about photovoltaics, converting that light energy into voltage. Uh, we had a separate lesson on semiconductors, so I'm not going to uh, dive too, too far on this, but pretty much semiconductors are this middle ground here. Electrons can be excited into that conduction band. They can freely move around. Uh, they're a little bit less sensitive to temperature. When metals are heated up, those increased vibrations cause more friction. It causes the conductivity to decrease, whereas for a semiconductor, by heating it up, more electrons jump up into the conduction band, allowing for conductivity. So skip over a little bit of this here. So we talked about being able to dope the semiconductor. Silicon is our primary example. It has four valence electrons. I can dope it with a little amounts of things that have less electrons, more electrons, and they can generate extra holes or extra electrons that we can utilize. So we have N-type if we have uh, group 15 elements because they have extra electrons. We have P-type if we have group 13 or group three that have less electrons than silicon. We can combine them together, we can produce a depletion layer, and then force the electrons to have to travel through an outer circuit instead. So it's going to be a direct current, okay, basically uh, we can harness the voltage in this external circuit. Uh, solar panels are just a large array of this one here. We had a separate uh, lesson on mimicking photosynthesis. So basically plant cells have chlorophyll molecules and chloroplasts. They absorb the opposite of green. That's why they appear to us as green. The reason why they're able to absorb is because of the conjugation in their structure. Conjugation is a shorthand way of saying the alternating single and double bonds. The longer the single and double bond structure that we have in the molecule uh, increases conjugation. It decreases the amount of energy that's needed to actually excite those pi electrons. That means we can then absorb a higher wavelength radiation, eventually not just in the UV region, but also in the visible. 
So this is the chlorophyll molecule, extensive conjugation in that porphyrin ring. So as the conjugation increases, as that structure gets more extensive, the amount of energy decreases. So instead of absorbing UV radiation, we start absorbing things that are in the visible spectrum. And again, it's important for you to remember, we transmit and we reflect the opposite color. Uh, DSSCs, we talked about in our other lesson. Basically, the DSSC mimics what chlorophyll does. It absorbs the dye, absorbs the light energy. It causes all those extra electrons and extra holes, and it forces those electrons uh, to go through our external circuit. Uh, the TiO2 has a nanoscale like structure, so it has huge surface area, and it makes these DSSCs more um, uh, efficient. We talked about producing biofuels using this glucose. So glucose is a high energy molecule. I can burn ethanol directly, or we can um, play around with what would have otherwise been waste oils. We can do a process called transesterification. We can regenerate them into esters that are more easily used, that are less viscous, and we can design engines that run on diesel that run on these biofuels. So uh, ethanol has some advantages and disadvantages. Ethanol is said to be carbon neutral because all the CO2 would have been collected from photosynthesis even after burning it and releasing the CO2, I'm not generating any extra CO2 that wasn't there to begin with. Anything that uh, we uh, create in terms of alternatives, it reduces our dependence on oil, so this could be helpful for our environment. The disadvantage of these biofuels here, typically they have lower specific energy. This is the energy per mass whereas energy density is an energy per volume, depending on whether you're working with solids or liquids, one way is more convenient than the other. Potentially, it can be damaging to engines because they can absorb moisture in the air. The hydrogen bonding can lead to corrosion. High energy cost of production, by the time you actually convert the biofuels enough so that your cars can run on it, maybe you're actually having the same carbon footprint as gasoline. And here I like this food versus fuel debate Basically, if you're using, you're growing crops here to harness ethanol, but the ethanol is instead of, um, it's being directed for fuel sources, instead of using that ground here for crops, uh, the worry is it will drive up supply and demand for food costs, and places which are producing all these uh, food products may uh, have to play around with the expensiveness of the crops and whatnot, and that can cause some more uh, political and more social issues. The energy content in vegetable oils or diesel fuels are comparable, although they are too viscous. So uh, we have our gasoline fuels. Typically, our gasolines run on lower uh, molar mass, C6 to C10. Those are the perfect uh, carbon lengths that we need, whereas diesel fuels run on slightly longer chains. We're going to see the longer chain molecules of vegetable oils as these triglycerides. It's made out of a glycerol. It's three fatty acid chains of it. Unfortunately, because those fatty acid chains are super long, they end up being very parallel to each other. We end up getting a lot of London forces as you go along the chain itself. Uh, what we want to do is we want to introduce some double bonds or triple bonds to introduce little kinks in it. Uh, in food chemistry, this would um, talk about unsaturated fats here. That's why unsaturated fats are typically easier to digest than saturated fats. Uh, they're too viscous. What makes it too viscous here, again, we can look at the molarity. These um, compounds are relatively similar in size. If we have all single bonds and those increased London forces, you notice the multiplying is some 70 degrees hotter. Even if you introduce the odd double bond, you let these chains here kink out on each other, that would decrease the London forces in between, making this less viscous. Another chemistry analogy that we can do here is we can do transesterification. We can convert one ester into another ester by reacting it with an alcohol using uh, different catalysts. Uh, transesterification, let's see there's a nice picture of right here. We can take the triglyceride molecule from a waste oil or vegetable oil here. We can react it with methanol and ethanol uh, under a catalyst here, and we can end up creating other esters. We still have an ester, but you notice now these three chains are not individual. They're no longer stuck on the glycerol, and therefore the viscosity is a little bit lower. So, I'm going to just replace those ones there. Like this is the last section on greenhouse gases. So greenhouse gases, it typically lets very short wave radiation come from the sun, most of it through. But then when light um, bounces off the Earth's surface, it tends to be a little bit longer wavelength. The gases in the atmosphere pick up those longer wavelengths and then they re-radiate back to Earth. 
So there's the solar radiation, it's short, high energy. By the time it bounces off the Earth's surface, it's terrestrial in nature. It's typically at a lower energy. Uh, this naturally occurs, that's important for you to realize here. Um, most of the solar radiation does get through, but what we're going to see is most of the terrestrial radiation doesn't get through. Again, this naturally occurs. The worry is our human um, uh, reactions are causing more, uh, more than the normal CO2s and waters and methane in the atmosphere, and we're actually increasing this effect. So natural phenomenon, 75, 75. Depending on your context here, CO2 is a very abundant um, uh, natural gas, and basically this is contributing to uh, global warming, uh, but the CH4 at the same time, we have less of it in our atmosphere, but molecule by molecule, its potential, its greenhouse effect is actually worse. It's actually equivalent to, I think earlier we had the 30 uh, CO2. Uh, other consequences that we have for having more greenhouse gases is we can cause more particulates, or more cloudy days, or more particulates, soot uh, molecules in the air. This will tend to reflect some of the solar radiation, not even let the solar radiation in, and that can cause even a global cooling effect to some degree as well. So global cooling, global warming. Uh, how these greenhouse gases are able to absorb the IR radiation, we talked about this in our spectroscopy unit. We have to have a polarity in our bonds, not necessarily polar overall, but if I have a polarity, some unevenness, some distribution of charge, I can absorb IR radiation, I can dance around for a little bit, and then once I relax to the lower energy, it can release the IR radiation again. So CO2 as an example, they re-radiate this energy here, here's just a uh, data track of how much CO2 in parts per million over the last maybe 50 years, you see there's a dramatic increase. This may be one consequence of global warming, although that part there is a little bit more debatable. There is seasonal variation, depending on sort of spring and winter, spring and winter, but overall you're still seeing the CO2 as increasing. Um, as we look towards like ice core samples and go like millions of years, hundreds of thousands of years backwards, uh, we see this sort of global fluctuation in temperature as well. So different models here for CO2. We talked about the global warming potential. Here are some consequences of the greenhouse gases. So ocean acidification, our ocean water is getting more acidic. So naturally there was a equilibrium between heterogeneous CO2 gas and aqueous. So basically our waters can act as a carbon sink. They can pull CO2 out of the atmosphere. But what's gonna happen here is as global warming increases the temperature of the water, we actually preference uh, the reaction in converting it to the gas instead of having it sink into the uh, store it in carbon dioxide in water. So less soluble in water, makes more carbon dioxide gas, gives it less ability to actually absorb CO2 from the atmosphere. As we get CO2 here, uh, as in general both of them increase, with more CO2 also in our waters, it ends up producing more carbonic acid, which is a weak acid that generates extra H processing solution. Uh, warming causes the more melting of uh, glacial uh, deposits, ice deposits. Uh, water will then just run off and then the sea level is going to rise. Water expands a little bit when it uh, becomes a liquid state. Um, so it's not all doom and gloom. How can we sort of manage this? If CO2 really is a big consequence on global warming, we can try to design cars that are more efficient. We can try to utilize more alternative fuels that don't rely on fossil fuels as much. We can try as sort of market-based control. I can put carbon taxes. I can play around with supply and demand. We try to control how much carbon we're using or sequestration, meaning we capture the CO2 before it actually ends up leaving. Uh, I think this is the last one here on uh, electrochemical cells. We talked about the chemical reactions themselves producing a true EMF. That EMF voltage is actually decreased a little bit by the internal resistance, by the current trying to travel through the battery the overall voltage off the terminals is actually going to be a little bit less. There's our typical electrochemical cell. We have the anode side here, typically on the left side. Anode is oxidation. The electrons only flow through the external circuit. Uh, they get picked up, they get reduced by on the right hand side here. To control the electrical neutrality on both sides, we absorb the salt bridge in the middle, and basically that prevents the side here from becoming because I'm gonna lose, I'm gonna be gaining positive charges from oxidation, the anions will go into the anode, the cations will go into the cathode side, 
uh, to replenish some of this copper or toothpaste that gets lost. We talked about the Nernst equation. In chapter 9, we did a lot of calculations with standard reduction potentials here, especially as different batteries are compared with each other, uh, different free energies. There is a temperature dependence. There's also dependence on how far the reaction has gone as a Q value, products over reactants, uh, to actually control well, what's the overall voltage as that standard battery uh, slowly runs. There's our lead acid battery here, which we use for our cars. Uh, we can uh, regenerate these uh, batteries here. These are secondary cells, not perfect. You will eventually have to replace them, but typically cars are designed so when you're running them, they're constantly charging, constantly replenishing. So those are the reactions there. They really like asking in this reaction, what's the advantage of one type of battery over the other? Uh, if I gave you these equations, you should be able to use oxidation number and actually track who is oxidized and who is reduced. So this one here is a cadmium ion battery. Cadmium tends to be fairly toxic as a material. Uh, this one here is a lithium ion battery, and then a hydrogen fuel cell. This one here is really nice because the final product is just water. It can be done under KOH electrolyte, which is a basic electrolyte, or an acidic electrolyte for a proton exchange. Kind of thing. So, uh, these ones here are more of the biofuel cells. I can use the biological molecules to actually run the reaction for us. And I believe that's the last one. So. Thanks for watching. I uh, hope that helps. And if you have any questions, just let me think of this.